Okay, the next item of business is a statement by Graham Day on industrial relations in the further education sector. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement. Therefore, there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Graham Day. Minister, around 10 minutes, please. And many thanks, President Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to make this statement on the important matter of industrial action in the college sector. It is an issue that is felt across each of our constituencies or region, and one which has regrettably been topical for a decade now. Colleges across Scotland make an immeasurable contribution to our communities, our economy and our nation as a whole. They do good work. But unfortunately, that is all too often overshadowed by the industrial strife which has dogged the sector for the past ten years. Regionalisation and the introduction of national bargaining has brought some positive change for many. And yet the relationship between employers and unions, particularly in some localities, has become fractious to the point where, where many of us think colleges, sadly, we instinctively think industrial action. Strikes have become the norm in the sector. I think I'm right in saying we've had industrial strife across nine in the last ten years, impacting students, staff and the wider community. And the truth is, presiding officer, that the overwhelming majority of those concerned want an end to that strife, not just for now, but for the future. Of course, there are hardline positions adopted by some on both sides, but I believe that amongst the majority, across management and staff, there is a genuine desire to have the present dispute ended and a better way forward found. The path to that has not proved an easy one, but there are some hopeful signs that we can travel it, and with goodwill from all sides, we can, I believe, reach a destination which serves the best interests of colleges, staff, and most importantly of all, students. And it really does matter that we establish more harmonious relationships in the sector. As the First Minister set out the Government's priorities last week, we, we know that colleges have a proven track record of delivering. Colleges as anchor institutions will continue to play an integral role in enabling our vision to deliver to the reform agenda and for all of Scotland. The disputes which have dogged colleges over the past 10 years have taken place against vastly different financial backdrops, when public finances were in a healthy state, through to now, where we find ourselves in the most challenging budgetary situation since devolution 25 years ago. And I acknowledge the budget settlement we've been able to afford colleges is not as we would wish it to be. The most difficult budgetary position since devolution has meant challenges for budget settlements for colleges and many other parts of the public sector. We would like to be in a position to invest more, but the fact is that uh, were we to invest more in colleges, it would have to come from somewhere else in the budget, from schools, from universities or other portfolios. But I do think it is possible that we could find a fair and affordable solution to the current dispute and absolutely make progress in ad addressing the systemic longer-term issue. Up until the last few weeks, we were at an impasse on the former. The employer's full and final offer of a £5,000 consolidated pay increase over three years had been rejected and no one was budging. So it is to the credit of the trade unions that they have sought to move this into a better space. On the support staff side, strikes by Unison members have been suspended to allow staff to vote on the pay deal and offer. It is, of course, up to staff to determine if they deem the award acceptable. I do hope this will see a positive resolution being found and that members of Unison, Unite and the GMB will see pay rises backdated to September 2022, landing in their bank accounts quickly. And EIS FIWA have made a revised uh, claim that would see this three-year deal accepted with the addition of a fourth-year pay rise for academic year 2025-26. Now, we are still a way off seeing agreement reached with the lecturers. There are various components of the claim which, as lodged, are viewed somewhat differently. But I welcome the meaningful dialogue that has taken place between both sides since this new claim was tabled, and credit where it is due to EIS FIWA for initiating this. Now it is vital the two sides continue to work through this to find common ground. Earlier this week, College Employer Scotland Executive agreed to resume negotiations and explore that option of a fourth year. The NGNC lecturing met yesterday to begin these fresh negotiations, and further discussions are scheduled for tomorrow. I have and continue to encourage the management side to see the move by the unions as an opportunity to bring peace to the sector until at least the end of the academic year 25-26 and provide that chance to fix the broken negotiating mechanism. But I do, recognise the, uh, do that recognising the obvious difficulty here, which is that they, like the Scottish Government, have no indication of what funding they will have at their disposal for 25-26. And as things stand, there are no extra monies. 
Presiding officer, there are those who have demanded direct intervention by the government in the dispute, despite the financial position we find ourselves in being crystal clear. The Strathesk report being candid in branding previous interventions unhelpful, and the national bargaining processes excluding such a role. And of course, many of those calling for this are silent on where these additional monies might be found from. And what the last few weeks have demonstrated is that when the collective will is there, we can see the existing structures made to work and hopefully deliver an outcome that is both fair and affordable. And fairness and affordability here are essential. I accept that there is a gap between what Monies Colleges would have had at their disposal now if funding had risen in line with inflation over the past few years. I acknowledge that puts colleges in a challenging position. I know how that feels as a minister when the block grant support from Westminster has fallen in real terms and the Scottish Government budget is further stressed by rising costs and competing demands. But collectively, and despite these impediments, we have to find a way forward which ensures colleges are on a sustainable long-term footing, where an injection of public cash is not an option, at least not without reducing funding to other parts of the education system or reducing funding elsewhere across government spend. President, officer, when national bargaining was introduced, uh, we agreed a system that rightly places responsibility for reaching agreement with the employer representatives and trade unions through the NGNC, uh, and that was int integral to creating a modern, flexible college sector. We, for our part, remain committed to national bargaining. That is why I have been clear the Scottish Government will not directly intervene in these negotiations and seek to force a resolution, because to do so would fundamentally undermine and alter the voluntary national bargaining process and have long-term consequences. Whilst I absolutely accept this current dispute has been ongoing for far too long, it is clear from the recent positive developments that the employers and trade unions are able to make progress within the agreed framework, albeit looking to the future. I think everyone agrees uh, it and the environment in which it functions needs changed. And we should surely all of us be encouraging both sides to develop recent progress into meaningful and constructive dialogue, which leads to an end of the dispute. But as I said earlier, we are still some way off that, and I do think goodwill gestures from both sides right now might go a long way to putting momentum into this. The subject of the planned marking boycott and employers flagging that they will withhold pay for what is described as action short of strike has been aired in the Chamber before. Now, both sides have legal advice that the employer's response is lawful, but do any of us want to see students further impacted in this way or staff losing pay? Can we not, if sufficient progress continues to be made in these fresh negotiations, which continue tomorrow, find a way to suspend that element of the action and take away the threat of deeming to allow progress on settling the dispute? President, officer, reaching agreement is not just desirous for the immediate and obvious reasons. It will give us space to really take forward the recommendations of the Lessons Learned report or whatever derivation of these can be agreed upon to ensure the national bargaining mechanism works far better going forward. I have convened a group of college and trade union reps to begin the process of supporting the sector to implement the recommendations from the most recent Lessons Learned exercise. That group met again yesterday morning. And I think the fact that the meeting went ahead for a, uh, a few hours before some of the participants were due to take part in the negotiations around the current dispute says a great deal about the commitment that is in play around this. Now, it is not within my gift to share with the Chamber the specific actions which are under consideration, and at this stage to do so would be unhelpful. But I am confident the efforts of this group will pay dividends, and I thank them again for their involvement. As the Minister, my role here is to a convening one, and I am hopeful it will be only a short-term one, uh, seeking to facilitate a broad agreement on how matters have progressed, then leaving those concerned to take them forward. Members who have closely followed uh, industrial relations in the college sector will be painfully aware of the acrimony and finger-pointing which has characterised negotiations over the years. They will recognise the talk of personality clashes and grudge-holding being at play. I have to say, President Officer, I believe there is now a collective will to move on from that. From all sides, I hear that they are scunnered by what has gone on and want to get all of this into a better place. My role is to help them do that, and I will continue to facilitate discussions to ensure the employers and trade unions can create an environment and a process that ensures successful negotiations for the future and breaks the cycle of annual industrial action. I will also continue to do all I can to actively encourage both college management and the trade unions to engage constructively in seeking resolution of the present dispute. Presiding officer.
Thank you, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues um, raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes, after which we will need to move on to the next item of business. Members wishing to ask a question should press the request to speak buttons. And I call first Liam Kerr. Yeah, very grateful, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. I also note both the tone he has sought to strike, although it bears noting that the Scottish Government is in fact sitting on the largest cash terms block grant in history, but also his remarks towards the end about his optimism that progress is being made. Accordingly, I shall offer three questions which I hope will allow further light to be shed without risking that progress. Firstly, the Minister talks of the National Joint Negotiating Committee being integral yet then talks of a broken negotiating mechanism. Despite a number of voices suggesting it, the committee remains without an independent chair. Can the Minister tell us his views on such a chair and whether any progress will be made on that? Now, secondly, he talks of credit to the unions moving this to a better space and initiating meaningful dialogue. He says that strikes are being suspended by Unison to allow staff to vote on the pay deal on offer. Can he advise whether this is the position of all the unions in this situation? And finally, he refers to national bargaining. He tells us that we've seen industrial action in nine out of the last ten years, but that's in a context where national bargaining has been in place for eight of those years. He hints at making the mechanism work better going forward. So it begs the question, is it a time for a review of how national bargaining is operating and whether it requires to be improved and or altered? Minister. President, officer, a number of questions in there and I hope to take a little bit of time to answer them. I understand the, the premise that William Kerr advances on the deal that's been on the table being put to members. Uh, and that's certainly in the context of the lecturing side, CES asked EIS for uh, to do what which the, the union felt unable to. However, in that context, we've moved on from there and that the discussions are now taking place around the four-year deal. And one would hope that if they can reach agreement, that would be put to the membership. In the context of the support unions, it was slightly more complicated. Unison put it to their members. United did the same, but they had not been striking at that point, and GMB had accepted the deal previously. It was a bit of a mixed uh, picture. On the wider point, um, I would say to him that you can be in favour of the concept of national bargaining, but recognise that elements of the current process and, and the environment in which it is undertaken would benefit from change. And I think the extent to which um, that is acknowledged can be seen in the commitment being shown from all sides uh, in taking forward the lessons learned work that I mentioned. There is a recognition of the problems and a willingness to try and address that. On the issue of the lack of a chair, I think he means that neutral independent chair that the staff desk um, report highlighted. Um, the negotiations are currently chaired on a rotational basis involving each of the participants. And amongst those parties, there is a respectful divergence of views on the merits of on the necessity for having an independent chair as such. There is, though, a willingness to explore perhaps the introduction of a facilitating role to insist in improving that process and, and work on that is underway. Thank you. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I too thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement, although I have to say I am somewhat disappointed. As, himself points, as he himself points out in his statement, this has gone on for far too long. He calls the situation topical for a decade. I'd say for students and staff it's been torment for a decade. And the Minister is right to make mention of the vastly different financial backdrops, but what hasn't changed in that time is the government or their unwillingness to act. The Minister says he would like to invest more, but he'd have to cut elsewhere to do that. Well, I'd remind the Minister it was his government who made the choices to redeploy college money elsewhere, his government's choices that failed to prioritise colleges, and his government's choices that got colleges into this mess in the first place. It must, therefore, be his government to get them out of it. And if he's not willing to act, then I would gladly take his place. So can I ask the Minister, if it's not his job to step in and save colleges, Whose job is it? And exactly what is his job? Minister. Um, there's a certain predictability about the contributions from that side of the chamber, sadly, and that is disappointing, presiding officer. Can I just gently point out to Pam Duncan Glancy, when she talks about the priority, the money being taken away from colleges, one of the principal challenges that the Cabinet Secretary and I faced when we came into post was the funding of the teachers' pay settlement. And I would just gently remind her there were many on her side of, of the chamber who were demanding intervention, settlement of the teachers' dispute. The government assisted the councillors to do that. The money had to be found somewhere. And then, of course, the cries are, where did you get it from? 
it shouldn't have come from there. And here we are again with the interventionists uh, demanding more action. There is no additional money here. And on the point about ministerial involvement, um, I have been active on both of the fronts that I have identified, working with both sides. And I have to say, they have been constructive in this, perhaps more so than Pam Duncan Glancy. And uh, I think I reiterate, there is an opportunity here to move this on, and that is the role of the Minister. I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Sue Webber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Now, this period of industrial action has clearly been a difficult time for Scotland's colleges, yet we must all retain our focus on outcomes for students. So, with that in mind, can I ask the Minister how the post-school education reform agenda can support Scotland's colleges going forward? Minister. Uh, I think there, there is an enormous opportunity for the, the reform agenda to support Scotland's colleges. Uh, and one example of this is the work that's going on to better align the relationship between the colleges and employers. It's not just with colleges, it's universities as well. To try and ensure for the benefit of those employers, the economy and of course the students themselves, that the, the education they're being provided with aligns with the needs of those employers and leads to sustainable employment. So to be clear to, with Michelle Thompson, I absolutely see a pivotal role for colleges moving forward in the reform agenda. Sue Webber to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you. The Scottish Funding Council, Audit Scotland and Edinburgh College have all said that the key issue is the continuation of reductions in funding in the sector, with colleges facing the real threat of running out of cash. And you've said yourself, Minister, that it's been a long-standing issue and has dogged colleges over the past 10 years. So what actions does the Minister think will be required to future-proof and provide fair funding for our college sector to guarantee stable employment relations and the learning experience for our students. Minister. Sue Webber, uh, I know, is a very reasonable person and she will recognise that part of the difficulty we have here is the actions of her uh, government in Westminster and the impact that's had on her budget. But let's set that to one side. What I would say to her, a demonstration of my commitment, our commitment to the college sector is to be found in the financial settlement that they've received. And I've acknowledged it's not what I would have wanted it to be. But it was in line with the funding that they received last year, as we said it would be, in a very difficult and challenging financial circumstance. But what I, what I will commit myself to is this. I, I believe that there are better ways of working between the government and the colleges, and indeed the universities, uh, around budget settlements and many other things. And we are committed to working with them to try and ensure that as the budget settlements, whatever they are, are delivered, they're done to best effect for the college and certainly to least harm. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Thank you, President Officer. I have had a lot of contact from college lecturers and union officials who I know full well do not want to be on strike and only want to be in the classroom doing what they do best. They are eager that a fair resolution is found urgently. I welcome this statement from the Minister, but can I ask what further steps the Government can take within our devolved competence to ensure fair work in our college sector and which attempts to resolve this long running pay dispute? Minister. On the context of the pay dispute and the wider um, uh, situation, I have um, outlined to, to Fulton McGregor in, in the statement uh, what action we are taking. The wider sense about, about fair work, uh, he makes a fair point. I mean, one of the issues that we have is that we make progress on certain issues, such as trade union representation on boards, which I think has real potential uh, to improve the situation in, in the longer term. And yet then we don't have trade union reps going on the boards for a variety of reasons. So I, mean, I think there's an area that we need to work on, because I think if we can get better trade union representation, active trade re re uh, union representation at the heart of the governance of individual colleges, it will certainly improve the governance and the individual relationships in those localities. Martin Whitfield to be followed by Bill Kidd. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Minister for his statement? And in it, he talked about the levelled criticism in the Trathesk report about um, previous interventions. I think it's right to say the report talks about last minute interventions. So, with the opportunity, with a chance to fix the broken negotiating mechanism, is the Minister willing to take that on? And how does he see that? being able to improve the environment in which discussions are taking place? Minister. Well, and this is not to dodge um, the question, because it's a perfectly reasonable question, um, but I think Martin Whitfield will recognise that it's not for me as such um, to drive that change. It is for the participants to outline what they would find acceptable, what common ground uh, they would find in, in the context of change. And I think there is a bit of that 
taking place at the moment. Um, I think because I think there is a recognition that the mechanism as it currently functions uh, needs to be looked at. But I think more than that, it's about the culture that surrounds the approach to the negotiations. I think we all know that over many years there has been great um, angst, great strife, um, a lot of harking back to what happened years ago in, in the, the discussions, when actually what we, what we need is a reset of approach and culture, as well as looking at the mechanism. And I will continue to, to work with the trade unions and the colleges. In fact, I think we will be continuing to meet over the summer to try and get that into better space. Bill Kidd, to be followed by Ross Green. Thank you very much, President Officer. And um, a wee bit of thinking ahead um, there, because my question is very similar to the question that just been asked. But um, I thank the Minister for his statement. But the, any, at the heart of any good relationship is trust, as he alluded to there. The Strathesk report identified the lack of such as central to the current state of industrial relations in the further education sector. So can the Minister say how we may firstly rebuild this trust or help to do so, and secondly, take forward the wider recommendations contained within the report. Mr. President officer, it, it may be that we do not end up taking all of the recommendations forward. We need to find common ground, and there are areas in the report where there is respectful disagreement. So, we, we, I think I said in my statement, we'll see some sort of derivation of, of, of the report, I think, taken forward. But Bill Kidd hits the nail on the head. This is a trust issue. At the heart of the systemic problems around pay negotiation over these past many years, there is a lack of trust, a lack of good faith, and we're not going to wave a magic wand and fix that. Um, the negotiating mechanism itself could be improved, but actually it's the culture, as I said earlier, around and the approach to it which is the bigger problem. But there's another aspect as well, a specific aspect that comes to light, and that is about, and it's, it feeds into trust around um, being able to the accuracy of the data that's deployed in some of these negotiations, the claims or the promotion of, of stances that a piece of data is accurate, then it's disputed that it is. And I think one of the things that we need to do is to find a mechanism so that these assertions can be checked out and everyone is clear on the facts uh, as they are. Thank you, Ross Greer, to be followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you. I hope the Minister will share my belief that one of the foundations of good industrial relations at a national level is well-trained, well-supported trade union representatives at a local level within each institution. So I was concerned to learn earlier this week that City of Glasgow College is proposing the closure of the Trade Union Education Centre that they run jointly with the Trade Union Congress. I'm concerned not just by the outcome, the impact this will have, but the process, a proposed closure just five weeks from now that would not allow for adequate consultation with college union representatives. So can I ask the Minister what discussions, if any, he's had with the College and the TUC thus far about this, and if he shares in my objection to the closure of this incredibly valuable asset to Scotland's Minister. trade union movement. So I have not had d direct discussion with the TUC, but the issue has been raised me, so I'm aware of it. My understanding is that the current contract of this provision concludes at the end of June. I think it may have been extended slightly. I, and the view of the host College is that the course is underutilised and underfunded by the TUC, who it's operated with in partnership. I stress that's their view. I'm not saying that it's mine. I understand that no final decision has been taken in GIA, and that is such any decision to end the course or move it to another college, which I think is the more likely outcome if it is to end in Glasgow, would be the subject to consultation. I also understand that the Glasgow College Regional Board has not as yet had any direct engagement with the trade unions on this, but they are due to meet next week, and I would encourage the unions to raise this directly with the GCRB. Thank you, and I would encourage members at the back of the chamber to keep the uh, conversations out of the chamber. Um, I now call Alistair Allen to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, President officer, as we know, a number of colleges have uh, undertaken restructuring exercises, including the one at UHI North Western Hebrides. Can the Minister uh, say what engagement the Scottish Government has had with the college and its staff throughout the ongoing dispute, particularly given the impact that even a small number of jobs can have in a rural community? Minister. Um, I visited um, the college in question in September of last year. Uh, I had discussions with the new board and with the uh, principal, and I met the student body as well. Um, we were very much alive to some of the challenges that are uh, faced there, and I, I know that is an ongoing uh, situation. Um, I have met, uh, not specific to that college, but in a general sense with UHI, both with the Scottish Funding Council and UHI itself, to discuss um, the future direction of the colleges and UHI Central as well, because we are all of us committed to the concept of UHI, but I think there is a recognition 
um, certainly amongst the, the constituent uh, parts of UHI, that things need to change. There is a view that the funding that is available uh, to the institution could be better utilised uh, across the piece. And I'm committed to working with uh, UHI on behalf of all of the colleges to improve things. But I do want to stress that any change will be made from the bottom up. Thank you, Alex Cole Hamilton, to be followed by Rose McCall. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister has done his best to strike an optimistic tone. Uh, we certainly hope that optimism is well placed, because this has been allowed to drag on for far too long with increasingly polarised positions. I do hope this is the beginning of the end of this dispute. Does the Minister accept that the intervention from the Government over the teachers' pay, although it may have resolved that dispute, has aggravated the College's dispute still further, particularly where money was taken from the College sector? Minister. Um, I accept the point to the extent that if you spend money once, you can't spend it again. But I, I suspect there were very few voices in this chamber raised at the time protesting about the settlement of the teachers' uh, dispute. And that's simply the reality of this place. I just want to, sort of, to be clear with Alec Cole Hamilton as well. Um, I think I'm being realistic about the chances of the current dispute being settled. I hope I haven't been over-optimistic. I've said there's quite a long way to go here before we get to that position. Uh, but I am optimistic about the longer-term situation being resolved because the will, the commitment, is actually there to do that. Thank you. Rose McCall to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Whenever there are disputes like this, it's always hard-working Scottish students that are impacted. Students in Scotland's colleges have had their learning disrupted for years now to, due to ongoing industrial disputes. While we recognise that negotiation is key to ensuring a mutually beneficial outcome, what actions are the Scottish Government taking to ensure that the learning experience of Scotland's students is maintained as the college sector is an essential component to future-proofing Scotland's economy? Minister. Um, I think the first thing to say is that I don't know lecturers or college principals who want to see students uh, adversely impacted by this. But you're right, the students are caught in the middle of it and have been for a number of years. In the context of, of how you address that in a practical sense, the member will remember that a number of mitigations were put in place last year around the mark and boycott that impacted uh, our college students quite successfully. Now, colleges are already looking at those mitigations, but I stress far better that we find a way to avoid that situation again, because I don't think lecturers want to be doing this to, to, to students. Principals don't want it, and students least of all want to find themselves in that position. So I reiterate my plea earlier that we get the, the negotiations sufficiently advanced that we can suspend that action pending getting the dispute finally settled. Rona Mackay to be followed by Richard Leonard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We're facing the most difficult budget since devolution began. Can the Minister outline how the UK Government's financial decisions have impacted Scotland's public finances? And does he agree with me that the opposition parties have to recognise the financial context when they demand action from the Scottish Government? Minister. Uh, good luck with that. Um, but Rona uh, Mackay is right. I mean, we, we, we have to be realistic here. Uh, I hear much criticism of the Scottish Government and the decisions that we made in relation to the teachers' pay settlement. I've heard us criticised for um, we set, uh, fixing the, the, the junior doctors' dispute, but that too has a cumulative impact on the government's financial position. The fact of the matter is the core grant that's available to the Scottish Government has gone down by £500 million, and that has an impact. That is the reality of the situation. And finally, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Minister says he won't intervene in the dispute, and in the very next breath, calls on EIS Feller to call off its action. Isn't that intervention? Why doesn't he call on the employer to resolve the dispute? Why doesn't he intervene to support that? Minister. Well, I, I would draw Richard Leonard's attention to the official report because he clearly wasn't listening. I called on both of them. To, I called on the employers to remove the threat of deeming. That's exactly what I did. I draw Mr Leonard's attention to the official report. Thank you. That concludes um, proceedings on the statement. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business to allow front benches to change.